Hello everyone, this is Dave Meinhard. I'm with the Vatikuti Foundation in Detroit. And with me is Dr. Mahendra Bhandari. He's the CEO of the Vatikuti Foundation. And we also have Dr. Sanjay Pandey, who's head of andrology and reconstructive urology at the Kokolaban Dairabai Ambani Hospital in Mumbai. I wanna thank you for joining us, especially because you're putting on the program today. Uh, the Vatikuti Foundation webinar series was established as a way to help inform, you know, not only surgeons, but the public on various medical issues. Today, we have an important program on gender identity establishment in children. I think it's important that this is a topic that's out in the open. And I really appreciate Dr. Pandey putting all his work together to make this program today. But to, to get the program started, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Mahendra Bhandari, who will introduce Dr. Pandey. Thank you for being here today. Thank you, Dave. Welcome, everybody. And at the outset, I must uh, thank uh, the audience for our public education programs. And they are very encouraging. And we started it as a sample of few webinars. But now there is no way we can get out because the participation is such large. And it has been well received. Uh, about today's subject and um, uh, the speaker. Why did we choose this subject? I had my personal reasons for choosing this subject in the Indian context because number one disclaimer, I personally and the foundation and the consensus does not believe in discriminating human beings on the basis of gender identity and sexual orientation. That's a big disclaimer. Particularly because I was reminded by one of the questions was sent to us that why didn't I have a class in registration of the transgender people? And I don't personally believe that human beings should be discriminated on anatomical facts. So I, I think Sanjay is going to address more about it. The reason for choosing the subjects are many. Number one, in Indian context, unlike uh, United States and other places, the, sec gen the gender identity is, is delayed because we don't have access to neonatal care as it should be. But usually gender identity is established as soon as the baby is born, which is not happening. Second thing which muddies it is that the gender bias in India. So Sanjay will talk about genetic sex. So he'll talk about contradiction in external and internal genitalial organs. He'll talk about um, the sex of the rearing, what a person feels. And I'm sure he's going to talk about what his parents want a child to be reared as, and is a far drawn conclusion a male. So this interesting subject, I couldn't have found a better person than Sanjay. And thanks for readily agreeing because I know his work. He has been involved in it for uh, uh, many decades. And uh, that is his area of interest. And he has developed it so well. So uh, uh, the biggest challenge for a specialist to tone down his talk to the ground level which a common man would not leave the webinar. And this challenge, I'm sure, Sanjay with his uh, elocutionary and oratorial skills will deal with it. Uh, what equity foundation would look uh, towards your suggestions on what subjects you would like us to cover next time? Because so far, foundation was involved in educating surgeons and leveraging surgical education to improve patient outcomes. But now we believe, all of us believe that alone surgeons or physicians cannot improve patient outcomes. There has to be a component of patient's contribution and understanding of his disease and understanding his physician. And that's why this is an effort of the foundation to really introduce you to the subject. Maybe you don't have, but at least you are educated about how to handle with the subject carefully or how to understand the technical language a physician would like or surgeon would like to tell you. So with that, I would um, 
uh, welcome Sanjay once again and hand over the podium to Sanjay. Good evening, everybody at the Vatikuti Foundation. And good evening, everybody who decided to invest the Saturday evening on a subject which has far reaching consequences for future. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Bhandari, uh, a teacher figure to me in the audience. If you don't know, Professor Bhandari was head of department from the same institute where I did graduate and did my MCH in urology, Jipma Pondicherry. It feels great to be you know, guided by you as many as careers have been guided by you in the country and abroad. And today it's a wonderful platform where I feel so empowered to be able to reach the society through the platform that you've created, which actually has moved uh, mountains in terms of understanding of subjects, both for medical needs and beyond. Before I play my slides, it is important today to uh, listen to that important topic, uh, which Dr. Bhandari did say. He did talk about, I need to tone down the subject, which is uh, so much uh, deep into um, arena of multidisciplinary, multifactorial kind of a combination, which is also a subject of empathy and teamwork. Empathy because today we salute parents and all parents who go through that agony and that agony can be quite amazing. So before I play those pictorials and probably put the slides on, I actually uh, look at each of you in this audience today as ambassadors on the subject. The subject is something where you may have heard of, you may have looked at, you may possibly see in future, but then it's always why me? Why did the child get that problem? So before we start, it's a salute to all the parents uh, who think as to why did Almighty do this to me and why did it happen to me around. Friends, this is a very historic and epoch-making event in terms of having chosen such a wonderful subject which needs to come into public domain. And therefore, Dr. Bhandari, that conference call we had late in the night and the apprehensions we had are actually taken forward to the next level by your very uh, emphatic understanding that these subjects should be in public domain and should be known to people around. Gender identity established in children. Friends, it's time to take it to the front row seat. It is important for us to wake up to the phenomena where this subject cannot be hidden under the vagaries of very complexities as to how God made it and how the whole thing matured. I'm attempting to bring it uh, to colleagues who have joined in today from the medical fraternity. Uh, many of my colleagues are here and around. Uh, to the society, to parents, and to mothers and children, and, and to teachers around, and the whole society which needs to know the subject in details. So establishing gender identity in children and what are those vagaries which we go through could be more of question and answer in a crisp session that I attempt to bring forward. I carry greetings from Kokila Ben Dhirubhai Ambani Hospital, where we follow a motto, every life matters. And why me or we? It's all of you in the audience today who have taken it head on to invest your Saturday evening on this wonderful Vatikuti Foundation establishment of bringing such a core subject to you directly. Friends, the quality of life of individuals matters and we understand that so much today on a self realize. I also bring you greetings from Team Urology at the Kokila Ben Dirbhai Amani Hospital, who happens to be actually around 24, 7, 7 days a week, taking these subjects to a very high level, the documentation of which I speak loudly on behalf of the Team Urology. While the world is at crossroads and the global threat is not over yet, the crossroads of umpteen kinds are visible to us. Let's move at a kind of a crossroad we are talking about. Imagine another crossroad uh, for somebody around in the world every day. On the day of a birth of a child, if there's a crossroad, if doctors can't say that it's a male child or a female child as the child is born, if parents run this dilemma on the day they should celebrate most, what a bigger emotional issue can happen than this? That means if the doctors can't say that this is a male child or a female child, the moment they look at the child, which is the billion dollar question that the parents have been waiting for, and the parents, instead of celebrating that day, run into a dilemma, which is going to be the journey of thousand miles starting from that very step on the day that they are born. It's quite an amazing kind of aspect that could happen to them. And this unfortunately happens quite frequently. The kind of dreams that they had, the straight dreams and the wonderful dreams that they thought about goes completely upside down and it's completely far from reality. Is that the reality they will have to take forward? Is what we are discussing in a very simple and a very straightforward manner. Have a look at a picture which I have uh, for my work, which talks about a male child. So if a mother sees this male child or the pediatrician or the gynecologist sees a male child at birth, 
possibly would be difficult to accept that is this my child is this a male child with only having a penile organ or a small baby organ through which he will pass urine but where are the two testes where is the entire external genitalia which means there's something wrong and she says why me god why did i get this kind of a distribution where you forgot to distribute something to me friends this is not an uncommon phenomena that as a urologist me or my pediatrician colleagues or the medical fraternity continues to see and that's where we have an empathy on the subject the subject is vast and therefore to bring it down we need to look at how do they go through and what kind of entrapment they go through and what do they feel about it and what is the kind of stress they go through if we miss it on the day of birth the first year of birth first decade of birth and sometimes they land up in our clinics across in the busy outpatient department where we see multiple things around so they look at who will help and why did i get lesser and why did i get this which means that i need to bring you to one important medical slide for you to get to understand what is the best computer ever made by anybody it's not the apple or it's not one of those hps and the dells that you look at it's the human body which is the best computer ever made which is self designed in an autopilot mode before birth during birth after birth and its years of maturation and conception and and to the geriatric age go have a look at this important slide which forms a crux of the medical aspect of why it happens so the criteria for determination of sex is what we teach our medical students is about there is a complete chronology of event which happens around as there is a conception which happens for a child the day the child is actually conceived which means there is a chromosomal sex given to somebody who becomes then an xx which is a female or an xy which could be a male male at the moment of conception the entire ball starts rolling you know that it's 9 months of pregnancy where changes happen internally in the body what do happen so after chromosomal sex is the development of the gonads or the development of those aspects which you did not see on the first picture which is around 45th day where there is an hy antigen which brings about the male gonads and then there is an internal genitalia which develops in the first 3 months because of the hormones being supplied during the pregnancy and then there is external genitalia which develops in the first 6 months because of tissue receptors and the various hormones and their metabolites and finally there's a sex hormone pattern being developed as a result of the chromosomal inlay which is developing which is the fetus is now developing things around in a pulsatile and a non pulsatile way the hormone changes which happen which finally bring about the the adolescence or the menarche kind of picture little later on in life these first five criteria in a chronological order sadly can go wrong and any abnormality in the first five factors leads to development of what we call as a intersex state or an ambiguous genitalia ambiguous is something bizarre that means the genitals which the child is born with on the day where a doctor cannot say it's a male or a female child or where the mother cannot celebrate that this is a male child or a female child could happen because anything which happens during the day of conception to the day the child is born and all these five factors are responsible towards what i talked about as god's computer which is made in a very autopilot mode where everything is generated and keeps going around the last three patterns are equally important which includes the pattern of behavioral center the sex of assignment and rearing which is imprinted by the environment the way we call a child a name the way we treat a child and these are all dimorphic differentiations which happen during the early age as they grow and finally the psychosexual differentiation which is a lifelong phenomena which brings about the gender identity so the topic of the day the gender identity in a small child could go somewhere wrong and that's where things can go haywire for a normal male child probably grown up and having his milestones or a female child things may not go so wrong then everything goes well with the pattern of behavioral center the parental care the teachers care and it's all moving up the ladder they get assigned and they have everything aspects but i'm going to talk about that factor or that hidden aspect today where children go through intersex states and ambiguous genitalia which probably may not be the domain of the society but it's a wake up call today it's a wake up call to identify them evaluate them treat them and who can be better partners than the society than the media than colleagues uh, in the society who pick up this today and have known about it partly or wholly and have been a part of this saturday evening investment at the what he could be found here friends a recent understanding of child's gender the entire mind and body aspect on that very single slide has undergone a paradigm shift we've moved from lot of unknowns 
in the era when i was training to the era where i work and practice to the era where we were taught by professor bandari and the era which is undergoing those amazing kind of research and the work that is happening around let's touch base for the society an important day an important day which we should never forget the last day of february is celebrated as rare disease day the last day of any february is celebrated as a rare disease day and you look at the number of rare diseases in the world you find that there are a huge number of diseases so 300 to 500 which could be in that list of rare diseases you can open up the website and look at it and you'll find that the topic which you are talking today is not rare which means that the entire conglomerate of topics which come into this subject is not so uncommon it's that you and i have never been a part of this uh, conglomerate to be able to see that but look at the incidence of some of them recorded because of the large work from the birth registries from the work from various organizations and the truthful work which has been done in the world and we goes genitalia or intersex states could be as close to 2.2 every 10000 live births recorded in germany scandinavia japan and in singapore so that's a kind of uh, figures come up in ambiguous genitalia when you look at congenital adrenal hyperplasia something where a change is happening internally one in 16000 live births could actually be suffering from congenital adrenal hyperplasia a very tough disease to remember so let's not remember names because you will have examples of this let's look at congenital vaginal atresia a girl being born without a vagina it could be as low as 1 in 40000 live female births but when we looked at our 13 surgeries that we have done in the last 10 years of girls born without a vagina we looked at 1 in 20000 live births in asia pacific region when we look at mr kh syndrome mayer rokitansky kusterhauser syndrome a very long name the short form of it a girl is born without a uterus and a vagina it could be as common in 1 in 20000 live female births friends the list is endless it's endless in terms of the kind of distribution which happens on the last day when god gives gifts and probably forgot to give some gifts to some and therefore they're born with some deficiencies so in this evolution of the subject we look at the child's identity and gender it's time to really bring it to the front row seat from this wonderfully strong platform because they are missed out we looked at india and we looked at the asia pac countries and we looked at they neg- neglected sadly they are managed differently because it's un- unfortunately managed differently everybody manages differently but it is actually a multifactorial responsibility and therefore a multidisciplinary team it's a difficult subject with social and medical connotations and as i said it's sadly with stigma stress and shame which is sad which is what should not have happened and therefore it opens up the huge pandora's box today to the society that the subject is could be probably hitting anybody if it hits anybody it also can be managed very well and to to look at that aspect today we are looking at a problem of extreme complexity where the family goes through the sensitive and stressful condition from day one when the medical team goes to the issues about what to give to the child as an assignment now or never how and when problems could be so variable too small or too big and it could sometimes be too less or too much let's discuss that sometimes some organs could be absent and some organs could be abundant some organs could be born deformed and that's how they could be missed out as i said many a times a, a mother or a child who could be probably knowing everything or probably could be the elder sister may not be able to make up whether there is a girl child or a boy child so we'll come to that we just have to look at some of these examples on this dark subject which probably needs a, a kind of sunshine a kind of aspect we need to look at so just to give you a little idea on the kind of reality that as a medical fraternity we go through on subjects of complexity which is not about a stone or a cancer but it's about to looking at discovering there is an uncertainty about the sex of one newborn baby is quite devastating and incomprehensible to the parents to most parents to almost everybody and therefore it's paramount that the clear explanations and investigations are commenced and that no attempt is made to guess the sex of the baby that that era is gone if it was ever there because it has to be by your complete evidence around because we need to climb those steps to reach a reality for somebody's life therefore it is a multidisciplinary team and a tertiary care set up across the world which needs to look into and there's extreme sensitivity required on this subject which means that understanding of sex determination and differentiation is essential to appropriate investigations and to establish a diagnosis i only brought this slide to give you an understanding that it's quite a difficult scenario because they can be variables from 1 to 100 it could be a to z and that's where we're coming to the fact file i talk about that the issue is not about a doctor or a team which can able to manage 
but it is influenced by a lot of decisions. And the commonest aspect I face today as a clinician on this subject is that I don't get to see them on day one. I may not be able to do much on day one, but I get to see them at the age of 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, and even 30. They come at those age groups around. Either they have been treated or they've been partly treated or they chose to be partly treated or there were those aspects which go on. And what are the aspects which go on for a presentation is influenced by multiple things. One is cultural background. And Dr. Bhandari did allude to India and the aspects that we go through India in healthcare where subjects of different kind, which could be pain, which could be fever, which could be cancers, which could be those things, which probably could get a higher parameter compared to these. Number two is the sex of rearing. Remember, India does not live in the four metro cities only. It lives in those hinterlands from where many a times there could be a name which could be called and there could be a sex of rearing of a child which could be called. There could be clinical features which I will allude to when I show you some of these cases which we have managed. There could be various blood tests and hormonal studies and imaging reports. And there could be parental preference, a very, very important aspect of this subject where a parent would prefer to choose what kind of a name to give, what is the kind of requirement and what is the kind of bias in the society where they live in. When we look at them in the adolescence and adult age group, which we continue to see many of them, we look at the fertility potential of these individuals and we have to look at the assessment of mental makeup of child if possible. And that's huge. That's huge in many aspects. Let me tell you that India has climbed very heavily on this subject when I open up a few things at the end of this topic. But to take it forward, I won't dwell on this slide. This is a medical slide which talks about so many things can be variable and that's the new definition of disorders of sexual development where it could be 46XX, I did talk about the XX, or it could be 46XY, differentiation abnormalities, or it could be some, some kind of a conglomerate which possibly may not be easy to define and it goes into not fitting into the above classical variations of trouble around. If I look into that and I look at the, the modifications and the hard work of teachers under whose guidance we have worked on and got that level around, we look at some of these cases that we deal with, which are realities from today's world. If you look at on the left side is a young boy who has now turned adolescent, but he passes urine through the motion passage or the rectum because there's no urinary passage and there is no male organ visible anywhere. He has got a scrotum well developed. He's got the pubic hairs developed. So he's in his 12th to 15th year, but there is no penile organ. That means he's born without the entire organ. That's completely absent. If you look at the right side, you see a picture where a child is born with two penile organs and two scrotum and four testes. So it's possible that God sometimes distributed little unevenly by mistake or it probably happened that somebody is born without an organ and somebody is born with surplus. And both of them can be completely incomprehensible to the parents and to the medical community too. Look at this child who was born with penile duplication, born with two penis, but just not with two penis, like two eyes and two kidneys and two ears, but also born with two urinary bladders and two urethra. And that's the kind of children who undergone, underwent reconstruction to be made into a single organ, to be made into a single urinary passage, to be made into a single urinary bladder inside. And that's the kind of work which probably the medical community has taken up as a challenge because probably something went wrong in the distribution of these children around. So I was talking about absent on one side. I was talking about abundance on the other side. And any of these two can be a dilemma both for the medical as well as for the community. It's a wake-up call today that each of you, an ambassador of the subject from a strong platform of Vati Kuti Foundation, look at the kind of aspects we go through in children. Let's look at somebody who for the first 18 years was brought up as a female. And I was talking about the term called sex of rearing. That means if you continue to keep calling somebody uh, 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 Shanti, 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 then she becomes a Shanti. That means you're calling her by a name. So she was Miss K and she was 18 years young when she saw me. She was reared as a female since birth, but she was 46 XY. That means she was a male. That means her genotype, the genetic makeup was completely of a male. But somehow, because she was a case of androgen insensitivity syndrome, one in 16,000 live births in the whole world, she actually had her genitals completely hidden. Everything looked like a female to the mother, and she rebelled her as Miss K. She had intra-abdominal testis. Within the, within the abdomen, there were testis. The scrotum was ill-developed and looked like a labia majora as an external genitalia of the girl. The penis was so small, it looked like a clitoris to the mother. And she continued to be reared like this, 
till one fine day something happened around and they did a sonography and they picked up that there are male genitals internally which are intra abdominal testes testes normally are born internally in the abdomen and gradually come down to the lower part of the scrotum around the last month of the pregnancy or the day of the birth so they could be hanging in a little lesser and a cooler atmosphere to grow and probably make this boy a boy but she was born with something intra abdominal this was androgen insensitivity syndrome and when she met me at the age of 18 years in 2017 4 years ago across this very table i asked her what do you want to be and she said i have been a female and i want to continue to be a female which means you had to remove her internal organs which were male organs and make her a complete female so other words she got a change she got a life and the change that she wanted to be when she came to know that she was a girl with a sex of rearing which actually was given her a hope and a life around so look at that that's a kind of stuff which can happen there's nobody's mistake the doctors couldn't have picked up because nothing looked like a male there nothing looked like anything which could happen i'm going to show you an example right now which looks like possibly that happening could happen look at this so 2017 the very year we saw of a, a, a 5 years young being reared as a female and these pictures have been actually upon request probably for teaching purposes and they have been donated by the parents around so that we could make society more aware so she is named as baby shanti she goes to a girl school she wears frocks and she wears skirt that when you call her shanti she will look at you and come close to you she was undergoing a lap hernioplasty a hernia repair by a pediatric surgeon on 17th of november in the fateful year of 2017 and he found that there were two testes inside the abdomen i did talk to you regarding this on a previous case 18 years young and he found that these were two testes their biopsy showed that they were testes and not over testes another structure which could happen she was 46 xy when we did a genotype on her so what does it mean she is a male but a sex of rearing for the first 5 years where her imprinting in the brain is already happen so strong and clear she goes to a girl school she is baby shanti she has wears a girl's dress but she is a male so the sex of rearing is a girl and she is a male and it's nobody's mistake it's possibly she is going through it that's why i'll take a small break and tell you how india has moved so heavily forward compared to any other country in the world other than malta india is only country in the world which has actually brought about a complete closure to these surgeries till they become adolescents so in an era before the madras high court came up with this very important landmark judgment we were actually operating young children also i'm glad that we have been brought to be hold held because we cannot do this decision making when the children are still growing up and when the bodies are still growing up unless unless the court allows us to do these surgeries for life threatening issues if a child is leaking urine from the rectum the child is leaking urine from the vagina those kinds of aspects happen as a result of congenital things we allowed to operate so by hippocratic oath we have at in india much higher aspects on this subject because it is ruled by the laws of the land only other country in the world which has got these kind of laws is malta in malta this has not been promulgated yet in the society but they have the laws they came up before us in 2014 15 we came in year later but right now we are under this madras high court ruling where we don't operate these patients at that point in time they don't need to be operated that's what the reality is so she is reared as a female and that's fine because the imprinting has happened parallel and that happened from the day she was actually told to let's look at somebody else 15 years a uh, young who's 46 xx xx means a female and what she has is a congenital adrenal hyperplasia i did allude to that it is 1 in 12000 to 1 in 16000 live births around have a look at this this is a female and unfortunately has got a male organ she is 15 and she is completely scared about herself now that it is the male organ which is the clitoris is now growing and giving it a male kind of a phenomena that means it is hypertrophied so much that she is also not able to pass urine going into near retention she needs a medical help and what we bring about is called as a reduction clitoroplasty well we remove this and keep the sensations on and things can go well this case happened approximately 11 years ago when she came in from a different city i have been told that at the age of 25 she has got married in the pandemic this year which means that she possibly has got what she wanted to be this was an organ which was growing without her knowledge let's look at somebody else in 2009 when the hospital started here she was 21 years young girl and can you imagine what has happened to her 
she is a case of extrophy epispadias complex that means she was born with a urinary bladder open to the exterior since the day she was born till the date we saw her and beyond she was always leaking urine from what you see is a urinary bladder which is coming out of the abdomen she was smelling of urine when she presented and she wanted to get married soon she was totally incontinent since birth and she was a case of extrophy epispadias complex with a shallow vagina so god possibly missed out on these aspects around where she underwent complex repairs and i gather that she has possibly got happily married at her age so these are the kind of individuals who go through agony their parents till at the end point in time so is she not a case who has got missed out yes she could have been picked up on day 1 year 1 could have been seen by a pediatric colleague could have been taken forward by a multidisciplinary team she waited for 21 long years before she came to us she finally got repaired and is doing well and what do we what does this talk about this talks about a subject which needs so much of empathy understanding because they shouted with agony and shame and discomfort we're looking at somebody who is uh, 16 years and reared as a, a female she is no female at all she is has both the testes hanging at this point in time and she is a male with 46 xx so that's the kind of aspect i'm looking at which is sadly covered deep under the undergarments where nobody can pick it up i'm just moving forward to give you an understanding that these are the kind of presentations we get to because they are missed out they are possibly not taken care of at that age or possibly they grow to a situation where they live in this agony of desperation and anguish and pain and dilemma as to what to do there are dilemmas of adolescence which i get to see where they look like uh, males but they internally females and the females internally males and this is not about being gender dysphoria or transgender this is about born with the problem because of deficiencies or because of lack of complete combination between the hormones and the capability of a computer which god made around let me also take you forward to this which is a very important subject called vaginal atresia that means a girl born with vaginal atresia could be as much as 1 in 40000 births you will not be able to know at birth you will only know at the time when there's a menstrual period happening around at the age of 12 to 14 where you suddenly find you suddenly find that the girl cannot menstruate anymore that's where you find that there is abdominal pain which happens every month at the end of it you find that there is a large abdominal swelling which actually is a case of hematometra that means the uterus is full of blood and no uh, blood can come out so vaginal atresia for a mumbai teen in that age group 5 years ago where she had underwent a vaginal creation and she's quite fine right now and doing very well i will look at another aspect of a patient who came with urinary blockage and she was 16 years young and constipated when we looked at there was a big mass in the abdomen after putting a catheter to drain the urine we found that the vagina was full of the blood out there in the first case the uterus was full of blood now the vagina is full of blood because she is born with an uh, imperforate hymen something which is again not picked up as a child so there are so many things which could be picked up as a child and many things which could not be picked up as a child so on day one you may be able to know or the doctor may be able to know the parents may be able to know or they may not be able to know friends we are changing goal posts as we understand more because it's time to come to you to come to society to make you understand that these kind of subjects as to why it happened to me and why should it happen to me is an important aspect of intersexuality of ambiguous genitalia which is about expression of both male and female characters could be happening partly because of hormone changes or insensitivities and that genital ambiguity that genital uh, loss of being taken one single direction could be quite a difficult phenomenon so today you are in a full immersion kind of a situation where you get to know that doctors deal with all this that's a complex slide only for our medical colleagues who deal with it and look at the algorithms as to how do we go forward and diagnose because diagnosis is equally difficult so it has become better and better with passing time and our teachers and researchers have got this subject for us i'm not dwelling on this but to give you an idea that it is all based on very strong evidence it all based on a lot of work that is happening around so where does society play an important role here it plays a very important role today when we see such children at the age of 1 5 15 20 and even 25 which i get to see i understand that only a positive media and a positive society can take it to the right level of awareness and awareness is possibly the key for example surgery to set the gender right gets a very cautious acceptance today only because of the media being positive on the subject as much as you and i are so friends good things do take time good things take time where a genital ambiguity 
where genitals being formed and either being malformed or being poorly formed, not developing to the issue of being mature enough with milestones is what would give them a future which could be completely different. I was attempting to give you an idea in a crisp time as to look at what could be our aspects of taking it forward. And friends, there are winds of change. Like you had the wings of change changing from jet to spice, you have got the winds of change where we as colleagues in the society should take charge on these subjects, at least identify them in time. We know that we have our hands tied up on the medical ethics and on the ethics of how to do this, but at least we give direction to parents. We give them a direction to take it forward. We operate them on the needy. I get to see few every month. We get to look at how to take it forward to the next level of these complex activities on hormones, on parental care, on the empathy from their own colleagues and peers and their own uh, um, friends. Or look at them being in school with their teachers. And therefore, they all play such an important role. It is impossible unless we probably bring this uh, together and remove that I am and make it possible. So from impossible to possible, when we look at these kind of subjects, we want to get empowered by reconstruction. We want to reincarnate on ourselves on a subject we never knew. That was 21 years old, who was living with extrophy, who finally get on to got a life and probably could move forward. So when we look at that kind of a reincarnation to be brought by medical fraternity, we need to come to you from this strong platform and make you understand that that's a kind of reincarnate. I do many of these patients whom I need to operate. I need to operate and give them their organs back, give them the shape that they need to believe. While I deal on these subjects of agony, anguish, pain, dilemma, discontent, and desperation for the parents, for the peers, and for medical fraternity, I look at that gender assignment or gender affirmation for gender-related individuals or children born with the problem, it's different from what we look at when we look at gender dysphoria or transgenders. For children who are born with uh, these kind of gen genital ambiguity, it's a very important wake-up call to bring about a sunshine in their life. Gone are the dark clouds where these subjects were completely hidden and I would see everybody at the age of 20 and 25. Uh, there are times when people get up and wake up and come much earlier than before. So that we are living in an era of evolution, evidence, experience, and expectations in a full immersion of a subject which is quite difficult. It is important to bring about a change. And any change is actually a bend in the road, but not the end of the road. That means it is not also an end of this subject because unless we make a fail, fail to probably cross over and go to the next side, it means we got to understand these children. While they are hinging between a gender which is quite defined by sex of hearing, quite defined by the kind of hormones that they have, and they are balancing themselves, looking at, I am born with this. These are the kind of organs I got. And these are the organs which are capable and these are the organs which are not capable. What happens when a medical team takes me over and what happens to parents who go through it when it should be celebrating is an important aspect. The issue today was to bring about an awareness and awareness is the first step in healing because we can heal, we can attempt to do that. When that awareness comes to all of you, that means you understand that there can be a genital ambiguity, there can be a gender issue of establishing in those needy children, not in everybody else. In everybody else, the parents and teachers and peers do a great hand holding. But in these children, awareness and awareness brings about responsibility and choice. That means each of you who registered today and got into this, are also important in terms of taking the subject forward of identifying the silent menace. Because it is important for us to look at that you can help break the silence if you know one such patient gets the right therapy in the cities and locations where you live in around. Let them not be a 10% human, let them be a full human is what is important. We can see farther than the ancient, not because of better vision and great stature today, but because they've been lifted by giants in the field of medicine who continue to be teens around behind all these Wonderful uh, stuff that you see. There's so much of research and work going on by the giants in the field of medicine who have actually made the subject much easier than what I did work up. But management is the key. That's where we as society need to understand the subject, which could have been as crisp as this in short on the work and documentation. But I know that the magic can be done by nobody else but you. You could probably look at this subject with an understanding that there is no more of stress no more of shame because it's something which should come out in the open and strengthen us to empower ourselves. I feel probably in India and abroad, all over, in children's overall health and gender issues, which is because of the genital ambiguity or changes which have happened internally, 
the headline should change from motivated Monday mornings, which come day after tomorrow. And they should say, I love my urologist. I love what equity foundation. I love the kind of uh, awareness drive which was created today. Friends, this is like thinking out of the box for what equity foundation to have taken this subject head on to come to and probably bring it the society as close to it. We live in an era of stress, innovations, and competitions. We live in an era of evidence-based medicines under Hippocratic Oath. An enormity of diseases and data. These diseases do get missed out because it's nobody's business. But setting standards of very high order will go very high level in Indian healthcare and healthcare all over the world because awareness could be the game changer which you and I have been capable of. Next time, if you think of ambiguous genitalia and intersex state, if you think of vaginal atresia and MRK syndrome where the uterus and vagina is missing, if you think of undescended testes, penilogenesis and microphallus for boys growing up, if you think of extrophy where the bladder is open, or think of a severe hypospadias and epispadias, you also think of the parents who go through it so much and daily. For them, life-saving, life-changing, life-extending and life-modifying treatments as sick and needy patients will bring them back to very active and fuller lives is what we aim for. As I come to a close, behind every successful man is a woman and behind every successful urologist is a gynecologist. Behind every successful gender program that we run across the world in various places as a multidisciplinary team are these intricate teamworks that we attach to society to make this revolution of the needies really worthy of what they deserve, they deserve to be taken forward. As I come to a close, awareness is a need today and always. We could have only done this much in the paradigm time that we had. The management will always be a dream teamwork with the help of parents and societies, the NGOs, and the kind of strong foundations we have in the kind of platforms we you create. Implementation is truly a challenge. It's a lifelong journey. It's a journey where we need to get into and probably take them forward. Dr. Bandari, Patikoti Foundation, thank you for inviting this subject. It was only to wake our colleagues in the society up that this subject deserves the true care and possibly the cure that they aim for. We in India stand much, much stronger and better. I come to a close at this point in time and put in questions if there are any. The first question is, my mother is suffering from urethral stricture since last 11 years and she's gone under dilation for 12 to 15 times in the last 11 years and four times catheter was inserted. The doctor said there's no permanent treatment for this. So I wanted to know, can it be treated permanently? That's a great question. Thank you for somebody who has come in around I happen to be a reconstructive urologist, and I know that there is an answer, which is a permanent cure. Uh, today, there's a huge body of evidence that female urethroplasty is not about treatment, it's about a cure. A lady going through multiple dilatations every year of her life and going through that nonstop is a sad story, which means that the lady's urethra has gradually got tightened up in stenosis as a result of post-menopausal changes. Changes which happen when the female hormones are gone, that area is no more bathed in the hormones which actually keep the area fertile and the area quite soft and supple. That suppleness goes away and many women post-menopausal probably can have a dryness which is called as lichen sclerosis, lichen changes and those changes can bring about a tightening in the urethra. Our gynecology colleagues pick up many of them which we get to see. As urologists, we get to see them. When we identify a lady of that kind who has got a urethral stricture, the final answer could be a urethroplasty. And there are techniques of urethroplasty in females, as many as in males. So it's not that females don't suffer from stricture urethra. Thank you for this question that you talked about. This can be repaired completely. And a reconstructive urologist, uh, any of my kind in the country, in every city that they exist, take a urethroplasty to the final level. We, in the last 13 years in this institute, and in my training back at CMC Velour and Jepma Pondicherry, did take up these subjects to very high levels. So we'll be keen to treat her and get her a cure, which she deserves that she's living in agony of uh, discomfort, not able to pass urine and living on catheters, dilatations and a refractory structure. She is treatable and curable. I really appreciate your passion and your, your care for the patients. We have another question here uh, from Shavalangam Ganji. How do you manage the psychological issues associated with intersex? So Shivalangam, that's a wonderful question. Uh, to an idea, the psychological aspects are quite ingrained in a child, and a lot of it is actually, uh, you know, uh, parented by the mother, and it takes forward. The mother needs to know, so it's very important for parents to actually not lament. For us to handhold them as child psychologists, as pediatricians, as doctors, um, as uh, colleagues, and as family friends, everybody needs to look at and probably help the parents first. 
From there on, from the parents, it goes to the children. In the early days, the children may not know much. That's a time it's important for the sex of rearing to be assured, reassured, given them the hand-holding. The psychological aspects are immense. They're not just less. The psychological aspects come in most when they, they are actually toddlers to school-going children. That's the time they compare themselves. That's the time they look into and compare with the peers around. They many a times get bullied and many a times get ashamed that they don't have what other children have. So psychological aspects have to be followed very, very extensively and very delicately. It's a very delicate subject where the child needs to be reared and given the appreciation of if you have lesser, you will have better soon. That kind of an aspect goes on. So child psychology is completely a, a, a completely different ballgame altogether. And it's just not one session. It's session after session of hand-holding, morale boosting, and it's all about what age do we see. So psychological aspects are somebody for somebody who probably gets to know. As a girl child at the age of 12 and 14 years, she has no uterus, has an MRK syndrome or no vagina, and probably needs to have those organs created by us by a robotic surgery or by open surgery. So we need to give them that handholding because they're going through a churning of journey, both on the medical side as well as the surgical side. And about that psychological aspect is a teamwork again. It's parents, it's peers, it's classmates, it's teachers. Thereafter, it's medical personnel. And I think it's a big ball game of all of us combining together. So it's a huge subject. But yes, not one person. And you can never be angry with the child. You can never probably give them that kind of an issue that uh, you probably deserve to be less. No, never. It's probably giving them more and more amount of encouragement. And that encouragement only can keep them positive in the journey where they undergo multiple sessions of surgeries or one surgery and et cetera, et cetera. Is there any national registry for children with ambiguous genitalia? That's a, that's a wonderful question uh, uh, about a registry. And that's not there in India yet. So the registries exist in Germany, in Scandinavia. I saw the Amsterdam registry uh, before I came in today. So the registries in India don't exist on ambiguous genitalia because, because Vatikuti Foundation was not there before to bring this subject to the society. In other words, medical colleagues do this uh, not so rampantly. The subject is still quite skewed because of the presentation from the day of birth to adolescence to adulthood, number one. Number two, the kind of presentations may not always be coming from Chennai and from Kolkata and from Delhi and Mumbai. Could be coming in from very smaller towns who could be seeing the practitioners of the art where they may not have moved to the national level or there is nothing such created yet. But I think it's a responsibility for all of us to create a national registry like we do for transplants, like we look, look for stone diseases and cancers. It's time to wake up to this phenomena so they could be allocated the right kind of, of treatment for them. So we don't have one yet, but I think some NGOs could take up this important challenge of identifying them hand-holding them, bringing all of them diverse group into one, because now the medical fraternity stands much taller and stronger compared to what we were a year ago, a decade ago, and decades ago. So I think this is something which we should take it forward, because this subject is so much underreported, number one, and therefore underdiagnosed, and therefore understudied and undertreated, that unless it is taken forward to that level. So we need to remove that curtains of underdiagnosis, understudied, undertreated, and therefore underreported. We need to go back and make more people aware. And that's the beginning of what we did today to the society through this wonderful platform. The very science that I talked about is a very essential balance that we have between seemingly two contradictory aspects happening around. On one side, we have an openness uh, of a subject, which is difficult uh, because it's not a single subject. It's a combination of it. On the other side, we have counterintuitive kind of a situation where how deep can we go and how deep the truth can be. So when you look at uh, the gender aspect in a child, we look at multiple aspects. We look at the gender aspect in a child from a psychological point of view, from the child psychology and from the parent psychology. We look at the peers as to how they take this forward, the teachers who are the early years of hand-holding this child into the phenomena. We also look at uh, clinicians who take that subject in the early part of life, which are our pediatrician colleagues. But as we move forward to the next level, it is a medical fraternity which has to take this challenge to very high levels of uh, hand-holding, understanding, evaluating, medically diagnosing, treating, operating, and probably taking it forward to the levels of reconstruction. Professor Bandari, your comments on the kind of aspects we go through and your, yeah. your very important aspect on this. Thing. Thank you, Sanjay. I think you did such a splendid job simplifying one of the most complex subjects because let me tell you, I taught this uh, subject to the postgraduates in clinics and all because I had an interest not because of uh, 
anything that in reconstructive urology, but because it has such a multifaceted patient that uh, uh, I recall an incident, uh, one of our teachers whom, with whom I learned uh, intersex, we used to call these days in CMC Valor, was Dr. Dharman. And we had published way back in 70s about uh, 34 or 40 cases because he used to do. So uh, he had a South Indian accent and there was a North Indian patient from Mumbai and I used to act as a trans, uh, um, um, you know, translator. And I was a resident, chief resident at that time. And one thing, uh, one day I was uh, sitting in my chamber and the mother came crying. So, uh, so I said, what happened? She said, I thought Dr. Dharman is a very nice person, but so what did he say? He said, ke tumhare baap ko bulao. <laughs> kind of thing. What he meant was, I want to talk to your father, which had so different connotation for a North Indian. So I think it's a very sensitive subject. Sanjay, coming to the point, you had alluded on that. I would be interested in a longitudinal care of these people. You talked of vaginoplasties. And vaginoplasty, I'm sure you wouldn't have done for, um, for um, Hager's dilatations or something like that. No. Yeah. So how do you really plan a longitudinal care of these patients so that you are not only surgery happy, number one? Question two is that still they may have a sex of rearing as you showed some of the grown-ups decided, society is accepted, but moment they know this contradiction is there, they have an internal turmoil and struggle within themselves, which may surface out, which may not surface out or show up as depressions and psychosomatic, psychotic problems and all. So how do you say, for example, uh, if uh, you have to plan this for an ideal society, from womb to tomb, what would be your brief uh, plan for doing so? Because everybody, you know, the, the pediatricians wash, neonatologists wash hand by identifying uh, gender identity and then leaving them to the society or to you people. How do you have a linkages to what you rightly said, like here? In fact, you should, or people of your specialty should know on day one, yeah. if not later, that there is some ambiguity in the gentility. And I'm sure you would be able to even meddle with the sex of the rearing, not to let it develop the other way. Oh, okay. wait. So what, what, what would be your recipe for a longitudinal care of this class of yeah. people? Which Wonderful. Are yeah. Wonderful, uh, sir, Dr. Bhandari, uh, and for all those who are watching around, I think it's a great handholding of the subject by you. So let me give you two important aspects on the two questions you asked. So one by an example and one by the thoughts and practicalities. Vaginoplasty for children of what I so showed was for two important aspects. One is vaginal atresia, one in 40,000 live births. And one is MRK syndrome where the uterus and vagina both are missing. And the girl is no more a girl if you look at that her main organs are missing around. In these kind of uh, adolescent girls with that age group, with that kind of a body composure, when we operate them, we actually create an organ which should be akin to possibly an adult organ. That means you are not creating an organ which could only be amenable to a Hagar's dilator. You're creating an organ which should be capable enough to be able to make her a woman for future. That means you do a kind of an intestinal vaginoplasty of a sigmoid vaginoplasty or ileal vaginoplasty. You bring about an organ creation which could make her a complete woman for her to be in partnership for future. And that can only be held well if the organ is probably operated, created well on reconstruction, but managed for future too. So these kind of parents and patients combination, that is a mother and child combination in a younger age group of adolescents, and sometimes the market syndrome in the 20s and 30s where they come with the partners and with the husbands is all about looking at continued to dilate, continue to look at the organ, continued care of the organ 
I and my team here looks at three to six monthly cystoscopy or a scopy or a, or a colposcopy and looking at those organs as to how the organs look like. Is there an examination and anesthesia look like? The hand holding of the reconstruction in the early part of the surgery to give them the maturity of the organ that you have created is what your question was. So once you create an organ or once you operate anything, it will always try to shrink and tighten. And not to tighten and shrink is the part and parcel of the aftercare which is important and ingrained as a part of the therapy for all patients in reconstruction, be it a urethral stricture, where urethra can, can be required to be dilated if there is one. Similarly, this needs to be calibrated to an adult size that we have created towards future use. For example, a 12 years young girl's vagina could be a very small one with a hymenal cover, but that you've created a complete organ by a surgical reconstruction, you will have to handhold the future of this organ towards it maturing and continue to be stable by a calibration, by a dilatation, by an examination and anesthesia. And that's a part of the understanding between the doctor and a patient. And that's the great understanding that we have uh, across the world between doctor and patient when we take such reconstructions around. Coming to the larger question, which is a more important question that you alluded to, sir, is about the psychological impact happens to an individual at different age groups when they go through it. And what does it mean to a, a colleague, a clinician, from the day of birth to longitudinal taking them to the years of maturation. And that's a subject which probably defies profile. In other words, uh, it is a kind of, you rightly said, a baton passing. It's a, it's a passing the parcel kind of a story in medical science from a pediatric age group to an adolescent to an adult. And can there be a way where somebody asks, do we have a registry in India of ambiguous genitalia? And that's the most impressive question of the day. That means, sadly, we don't have at this point in time a registry. So if this is a multifactorial disease where there's a psychological issue, where there is a psychosexual issue, where there's an issue of differentiation and issue of hormones, there's the issue of pediatrics and there's the issue about parents and the society, we got to keep them on one side and balance them with the medical fraternity of those involved on the other side. So this subject probably, as I said, defies profile because there's a huge amount of stuff required to balance them. And that balance will only be possible if you look at the psychological aspect. Somebody who has matured and is suddenly told you are not this, but you are that because your organs are this. So in our understanding is that they would continue to love to live what they have lived with unless there's a sea change which is going to happen or there's a dilemma going to happen. For example, Miss K was 18 years young. She had competed at 10 plus 2 in 2017 and sat across this table and said, I have lived as a female, though I come from economically backward society. I live as a female and I want to be a female. So what all you can do to continue me living as a female was a very straightforward impact that I got hit because somebody has accepted it so well. Compared to somebody, as you rightly said, will not be able to accept it. And that's where our psychology colleagues need to come and take charge. That means it's not one session, but multiple sessions of clinical psychology and psychiatrists, parents, peers, and obviously partners will have to take this subject forward. So one, registry. Number two, identifying this these children on the day of birth, looking at how to take them forward in future, their rearing, their sex of rearing, their hand holding, organs which need to be operated under the law and under the medical science with the Hippocratic oath of doing no harm. And then finally taking it to the next level where we don't pass the baton, but be a part of the reconstructive care where we mature the organs that we have created around. will actually probably prove a point and probably hit the nail absolutely as required. Uh, Sanjay, I think... Uh... It would not be a rehash of what you've already said, but my concern is the childbirth in particularly Indian context is a societal issue. It's no more a family issue. Here, it's totally different society. It's a societal issue that the whole village knows about so-and-so has a son or he doesn't have a son. Yeah. Now, how do we grapple with this situation? I'm, I'm again focused on that particular child who is oppressed. I'm not interested in what society feels or whether parents would uh, um, lose the title that they don't have a male child. I'm not, I'm, I'm thinking purely from the behavioral aspect of this person who for no fault of his or hers is suffering because of the societal pattern and cannot lead a normal life. The moment a child is born, 
the village comes to know, the town comes to know, the society and extended relatives come to know. It will not be easy for the parents to start with because it's not the larger society, but still the parents play the most pivotal point because it's not the medical fraternity yet, but the parents. And that's where I think the society needs to come stronger as individual parents who possibly will not be strong on day one. On day one, they are devastated. They're probably under a confluence of why me? And it takes quite a time for them to be built up. So for a child who's oppressed, for a child who goes to school, I think it's all important for the parents to play the part. As clinicians, you and me, possibly, and as probably ministries and governments and the larger society you talked about, will play a role only if I am weak or I'm strong. If I as parents are strong enough and we as parents can take this child forward, then we can do anything. We could probably migrate. We could actually probably, uh, you know, uh, fight the society in terms of telling that uh, this is our child and we know what to do to it. There are examples of it. We probably would uh, take the right medical help in time. And we possibly will talk to the teachers. We'll talk to the, the, the closest friends around. And that is how, because the child does not spend all the time with parents all the time. It could be first three to five years, but thereafter he goes to school. You got to let him go. So therefore, this will be a very difficult topic when it comes to taking the child to different aspects of the journey. And we will have to look at uh, the parents and the parents and it centers around the parents. Now, because they are the ones who gave the child a name. They're the parents who actually center around the behavioral aspects around. But if we handhold all those people who will play a part, which includes their closest friends, their teachers in the early years, possibly the acceptance happens around. That means they can be told that somebody got ABCD, you have got XYZ. And that, that could be a way to take the subject to the next level. Because this question which you asked has never been asked yet. This question has never been addressed yet. This is a wonderful question. This question is a dilemma and the dilemma is quite deep because the child is oppressed and being oppressed by everybody. The parents if get depressed at the same time, it will keep a disaster. So parents need to be strong. The, 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 the peers need to be strong. That means the brothers and sisters. And probably they would take all the subsets forward to get this child out of oppression which is obviously a medical care and a care which parents need to give and obviously the care of growth, which is the teachers and the, and the students around. That's a difficult subject. The medical part of it obviously will be dealt gradually and slowly. So have we addressed some questions? I, I was a little uh, distracted. Yeah, we, did. We, did, we did talk on the questions which actually came in around. And there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a topic here, gynecologists face one or more issue, uh, what to write on birth certificate. So... So yeah, there's a, there's a question out here from Swati, which I just picked up on the chat box. Uh, gynecologists faced one more important issue as to what to write on the birth certificate. So it no, won't be so easy on the day of the birth to write what it looks like beyond it. And therefore you are not gynecologist alone. You have a team. You have a pediatrician also who probably revives a child out of, uh, out of the, the, the wake up, the first wake up when the child cries. So I think for you, uh, what you pick up at that point in time as a clinician is what is important. Therefore, this subject belongs to all the gynecologists who are involved in obstetrics, where they bring about a birth of a child. They need to know, they need to examine the child, and they can examine only this much. Don't forget that the gynecologist also has looked at her ultrasound, has looked at the ultrasound of the mother in womb. So she has got a great idea of all this. But she's also the same lady who actually would handhold the subject. Remember, a gynecologist comes out of cesarean section or after a delivery and says, a child is born. And if she breaks that news that a child is born and I cannot tell you what sex it is, it probably is all about, you know, a despair and a dream which has gone shattered. So that's where a gynecologist will have to be trained around. She has to gently break a news in a way that she does. She probably takes help. And many a times a neonatal help and a pediatric help is always available. And therefore, she gives them a right answer. The answers are something which one individual cannot give. It's only time will tell. And therefore, investigations as time goes on has to be taken forward. Thank you very much. Uh, Dave, would you like to conclude the webinar or make a next announcement or something? There, there you? are two more questions. For your wonderful experience, learning experience for me. They have a wonderful update. Uh, and uh, thank you very much. And we hope to bring you back in sometime uh, on uh, related subject because the response was enormous on this uh, webinar. Thank, thank you. you so much, sir. It feels proud. We, we have two more questions in the Q&A box that I yes, please. think we might want to touch on. One is from a, a surgeon that says, just yesterday I saw an 18-year-old boy who had underwent bilateral 
Orchidopexy at the age of five years. He doesn't know the exact date. He doesn't have the documentation. But now they came to them complaining of not having secondary sexual characteristic features. They have a small penis size, scarce pubic, and axillary hair, and bilateral gynecomastio grade two. And they'd like to know, what, what do you think about managing this case for the patient and their caregiver? So uh, a child which was ably and comfortably and rightly managed uh, when he was five years old by giving him an orchiopexy, possibly uh, need, as a reminder, it could be an uh, aspect that we remember the testis which undergoes its maturation best in the scrotum was actually high up on both sides. So an orchiopexy being brought about, the penis not growing in size. Remember, this is also a very extreme degree of ambiguous intersex state which happens around. In such situations, if the growth has not happened around, the testis has its functions on a lesser side. And this child needs to be looked at now that the child is 18 years young. He is reared as a male. And he has got his organs which may not be capable enough to, for him to continue to the next level of adulthood. I think we need to look at hormones because the hormones are missing from the testes which are shrunken, testes which are incapable, and something which we need to take forward. So there will be endocrinologists in the beginning. They will look at external hormones. They will give him the delayed puberty to be bring up to puberty. And thereafter, as required, the organs grow around with the, the injectable hormones, and then we take it forward. It's a, it's a science which is very much in the realm of treatment, and we need not feel sad that we miss it out. Somebody did a great job at the pediatric age group. Now that he's adolescent going into adulthood, he can be completely managed. And there's what interventions are available for gender dysphoria, and how do kids do post-surgery? Do they cure well? So I'll take the first, second question first. How do kids do after surgery? In the realm of medical science, we intervene with an understanding that when we are reconstructing, we look at uh, two steps forward and one steps back. Two steps forward in terms of giving them great, but it could be one step back in terms of the healing powers and things can sometimes go wrong. And that's what is reconstruction about a difficult art. So kids do well because of an understanding that we do in a consent understanding that we could probably be in that broad discipline attempting to treat something which can possibly go a little tighter or lesser and we'll handle it is a way forward. When we look at gender dysphoria, a subject which goes beyond it on the last three points of determination of sex, that's completely a different subject altogether, where the subjects of gender dysphoria from male to female and female to male are completely different. They are for people who are individuals who are mature, who are grown up, who understand the subject very well. They are completely focused and they have a non-negotiable entity within them where a brain wiring perhaps gone wrong and we cannot treat them by a psychotherapy or by any kind of a reward or any kind of a force. We need to bring the body to the mind and the mind has adjusted itself, understanding that I am this and I am that. We need to respect that subject. The subject is very much in the public domain and we look at bringing the body to the mind. That means we adjust them to a point in time where they do well. So gender dysphoria surgeries are immense. They are of umpteen kinds that I do and colleagues across the world do. Those surgeries are again uh, done with a lot of understanding, with a lot of legalities, and that's a different aspect altogether. Patients continue to do well. We bring down their expectations to realistic levels when we operate such kind of major subjects. But in both, the children going through ambiguous genitalia and undergoing surgeries as they mature, and sometimes may require one or more surgeries. Same in gender dysphoria. Sometimes things can go a little haywire from what we had given them in terms of healing. And sometimes there could be requirement of one or more surgeries to bring them back to track. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much, Dr. Pandey. It was a very fascinating topic. And once again, your passion really shows. And I, your patients are fortunate to have someone like you to, to be there for them. Thank you again for uh, having come in such numbers. This subject has been opened up to the society from no other stronger platform than what he could be foundation. If he's really proud and humbled at the same time, to be taking that subject which we do constantly and very silently, trying to mend and trying to treat and trying to cure and bring them to give them active and fuller lives from what they probably have not got is a subject which really defies profile and is challenging. I, at this point in time, salute all colleagues in pediatrics, in gynecology, in endocrinology, in anesthesia, in all subjects who are involved in this composite care that we bring around and we need their help all the time. Also clinicians across India who have been actually referring cases of these kind 
I salute all of you for having understood these subjects. They come with complexities at different age groups altogether. And we continue to strive hard to make that important aspect, which uh, Dr. Bhandari alluded to as a longitudinal care. Someday we could have an ambiguous genitalia or intersex states registry in the country. Someday we'll have more colleagues taking up the subject in a much larger way. And teams will thrive doing good to society, where society has agreed to partner and take the responsibility of being ambassadors on such difficult subjects. Thank you again, all of you. Have a great weekend from here. Do you want to give our viewers your information on how to contact you or if they need to, can they just reach out through Kokolaban Hospital? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So I work at the Kokolaban Thirubai Ambani Hospital as a consultant urologist with the team. I'm reachable uh, uh, by my email, which goes by the name sanjaypdr at gmail.com. I'm on the social media. You could pick me up on the YouTube, on the YouTube channel. You could pick me on the Twitter and you could leave me a personal message anywhere uh, on my Gmail, which is sanjaypdr at gmail.com. Uh, keen to help as many individuals on understanding of the subject. At the same time, handholding colleagues on this subject who already are doing a wonderful job in the country. So salute to all of you because uh, availability is no more a uh, 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 domain where we are hidden around. On a social media of the Twitter or the YouTube or my Gmail called sanjaypdr at gmail.com, I'm very much reachable. And you could always shoot your questions back to what you could foundation who could, who could uh, what wonderful teamwork that they have done. They could pass the questions and informations and probably my contacts to each of you as required. Well, thank you again for your time this evening. I know it's, you know, your Saturday night. I hope you enjoy the rest of it and thank we you. appreciate the work you do. Thank you very much. Dr. Bandari, thank have you. a great day. And thank you. thank you, Dave. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sanjay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. We take a leave and we'll be back again. Congratulations. Okay. All of you.